Welcome to this course, Introduction to Cybersecurity Literacy. This is Lesson 28, Social Engineering. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of social engineering, and I'm going to introduce a number of social engineering threats that you should be aware of. What is social engineering? Social engineering is when an attacker creates a social situation that encourages a potential victim to let his or her guard down. Social engineering schemes usually play some kind of mind games with their target. Here's a good example of social engineering. There was once a bank that hired security testers to discover vulnerabilities in their security systems. The testers loaded malware onto several USB drives and left them lying on the ground outside of the bank, where employees would see them on their way into work. When employees noticed a USB drive on the ground, they tended to scoop it up and to bring it into work with them. Once inside, they would plug the USB drive into a computer to see if they could figure out who it belonged to. Unbeknownst to the bank employees, these USB drives had malware loaded onto them. <laughs> Plugging the drives into a computer caused them to upload the malware onto the computer. Since this was just a security test, the malware wasn't harmful. Even so, this is a good example of social engineering. The security testers knew that bank employees would feel curious when they saw the abandoned flash drives on the ground. They also knew that many employees would feel like they were doing the right thing if they plugged the USB drive into a computer because they might be able to figure out who the drive belonged to. The security testers engineered the situation so that common social practices would lead the employees to put the company's computers at risk. There are many other kinds of social engineering. Let's look at four common social engineering threats. Instant messages, fake antivirus or scareware, emails, and phone calls. Social engineering threat number one is instant messages. Attackers can use instant messaging services like Skype, Facebook chat, or Google Hangouts to help spread malware. It's not that they will deliver the malware directly through the instant message. That's not a real risk. What generally happens instead is that an attacker will embed malicious links into a message. These malicious messages might play on feelings like curiosity, urgency, or insecurity. For example, an attacker with the messenger handle Windows Help Team might send you an instant message that says, Warning! Your system is out of date. Urgent Windows system update required. Please download vital updates at www.microsoft-updates.com backslash vital. What the attacker is doing here is trying to scare you so that you won't read the link closely or think too hard about whether or not it's a good idea to click on it. And trust me, it's not a good idea to click on hyperlinks in a message like this. No legitimate software company would send you a scary message like this to notify you about a software update. Or to imagine another example, an attacker with the messenger handle CrushFinder might send you a message saying, two of your chat contacts and four other cutie pies are searching for you at crushfinder.com. Click here to learn who. Again, the attacker is trying to provoke an emotion or curiosity-driven click before you think too hard about why you might not want to click on such a link. Social engineering threat number two is fake antivirus or scareware. Another social engineering tactic is the fake antivirus or scareware pop-up. Fake antivirus windows are pop-up messages that are designed to look like real antivirus messages. In this example, the fake antivirus window is designed to look much like a real Windows Explorer window. But if you look closely, you can see that it's actually appearing within a web browser, not within Windows Explorer itself. Fake antivirus windows will generally use a lot of scary looking red icons and red text to tell a user that their computer is absolutely crawling with malware. The goal is to put the user into a state of fright or confusion so that users will try to interact with the fake antivirus window. If a user clicks on it, then the fake antivirus window will take the user to a malicious web page containing malware, perhaps in the form of a drive-by download. Attackers use two common methods to deliver fake antivirus windows. The first is just to use a web-based pop-up. If you get to a web-based fake antivirus window, you should close it but without clicking on it, 
And then you should navigate away from whatever page you were on that delivered that pop-up to you. The second way that attackers deliver fake antivirus windows is through malware that's already running on your computer. Certain types of malware will create these fake antivirus windows on your computer, and then if you click on the windows, you'll be directed to a web page that contains even more malware. If you frequently see fake antivirus pop-ups on your computer, that could be a sign that your computer has a malware infection on it. Social engineering threat number three is emails. Email is a popular tool for spreading malware. But for you to get malware from an email, you must be tricked into interacting with that email somehow. You have to click on a hyperlink or download and open a malicious attachment. So how do attackers encourage users to interact with malicious emails? Well, they use social engineering tactics. This first example shows an email designed to encourage the recipient to open a malicious attachment. Let's read the email. The subject line says, worm alert. Dear customer, our robot has detected an abnormal activity from your IP address on sending emails. Probably it is connected with the last epidemic of worm, which does not have official patches at the moment. We recommend you to install this patch to remove worm files and stop email sending. Otherwise, your account will be locked. We had archived the patch because the worm can modify unpacked exe files. You should open the archive file, enter the password, and run the patch immediately. Password, dog83, from the customer support center robot. This email claims that some kind of automated service has detected abnormal activity coming from the recipient's computer. It tells the recipient that they probably have a malware infection on their computer and that the solution for this infection is to download the attached file. If the recipient of this email downloads and opens the attached file, they will no doubt end up with a malware infection, perhaps one that is very similar to the infection that they thought that they were fixing. Remember, you should approach unexpected and unknown email attachments with suspicion. You shouldn't open attachments from unknown sources. If you feel in the least bit suspicious of an attachment, you can always call the sender on the phone and ask about it before you actually download the attachment. And remember, no legitimate software company will ever send you a software patch in an email. You should ignore and delete any emails that claim to contain software patches. This next example shows an email that has no attachments but is instead designed to encourage the recipient to click on malicious hyperlinks. Let's read it too. The subject line says, Dr. Gregory has sent you a photo from vacation on November 30th at 6 o'clock in 2006. Dr. Gregory has sent you a photo from vacation. Click here to view the photo Dr. Gregory has sent from vacation. Click here to share your photos with a friend. At Vacation Photos Online, we care about your privacy. We have sent you this notification to facilitate your use as a member of our service. If you don't want to receive emails like this to your email account in the future, please click below. This email claims that the links lead to a photo sharing service which Dr. Gregory is using to share his vacation photos with you. In reality, the links will just take the recipient to web pages that are loaded with malware or scams. What do you think? Would you have fallen for this email? Would you have clicked on any of these links? Would you have fallen for it if, instead of Dr. Gregory, it said that it was from somebody that you know, say, a friend from school or a relative? Here's an example that doesn't have anything to do with malware, but it's still a scam. The subject line says, Help! I'm writing this with tears in my eyes. My family and I came over here to London, United Kingdom for a short vacation. Unfortunately, we were mugged at the park of the hotel where we stayed. All cash and credit card were stolen off us, but luckily for us, we still have our passports with us. We've been to the embassy and the police here, but they're not helping issues at all, and our flight leaves in a few hours from now, but we're having problems settling the hotel bills, and the hotel manager won't let us leave until we settle the bills. Well, I really need your financial assistance. Please let me know if you can help us out. I'm freaked out at the moment. Joe. Poor Joe, right? This email appeals to the recipient's sense of sympathy. If this story were true, many readers probably would want to help out poor Joe and his family. But of course, this is a trick to steal money from do-gooders like you and me. Notice that the scammer used a common American name, Joe, for the supposed victim in this story. 
The scammer probably sent this email to hundreds or thousands of recipients, and no doubt, many of them really do know somebody named Joe who have families. So it's possible that the recipient would think that they knew who the email came from, even if they really didn't. This next email pretends to come from the recipient's bank, Wells Fargo. You might wonder, well, how did the scammers know which bank their targets would use? Well, they probably didn't know. Wells Fargo is just a big bank, and if the scammers send out hundreds or thousands of scam emails, they're bound to contact several Wells Fargo customers just by accident. This is especially true if they target people who live in an area with a Wells Fargo branch nearby. For example, they might target a university community at a school that has a Wells Fargo branch on campus. They would know that a number of students are sure to open up accounts at the campus branch. Let's read the email. The subject line says, Account deactivated. Dear valued Wells Fargo member, Due to concerns for the safety and integrity of the Wells Fargo account, we have issued this warning message. We have noticed that your Wells Fargo online account needs to be updated once again. Please enter your online account information because we have to verify all of the online accounts after we have updated our Wells Fargo online banking site. To verify your online account and access your bank account, please click on the link below. And then there's some links. And notice at the bottom says, This email was sent to all our Wells Fargo customers. Recently, we have found that many accounts were hacked. This phishing email is pretty straightforward. It claims that the recipient needs to update her Wells Fargo online account. No doubt the hyperlinks on this email will lead the recipient to a fake Wells Fargo page that will attempt to collect her login information for her bank account. What do you think? Were any of these emails more convincing to you than the others? Can you imagine you or somebody you know clicking on the links in these emails or replying to them? Social engineering threat number four is phone calls. Social engineering can happen out in the physical world too, not just in the cyber world. We've already seen the example of the malicious USB drives left outside at the bank. Social engineers will also use things like phone calls to trick people into accepting malware onto their computers. In one common tactic, an attacker will call a target claiming to be a representative of a popular software company or an IT professional from the victim's work, school, or internet service provider. They might claim that the target's computer has been compromised. Or they might pretend to offer the victim a free software checkup or a free trial of a new security program. Their goal is to smooth talk the victim into sharing sensitive information and granting permission for the attacker to remotely access the target's computer. Once the attacker has remote access to the computer, they can install malware on it or perform any number of other sinister deeds. Now, so far, we've mostly been talking about using social engineering to spread malware. But, of course, attackers can use social engineering for other sinister purposes as well. Another common use for social engineering is phishing scams. Phishing scams are scams where an attacker uses some kind of bait to trick a victim into sharing sensitive personal information, like social security numbers or login information for bank accounts. So remember, there's other issues besides just malware. Social engineering can be used for a good old-fashioned scam. Okay, in this video, we've discussed four potential social engineering threats. Instant messages, fake antivirus, emails, and phone calls. And remember, social engineers prey on emotions when people are most vulnerable, and scammers are willing to stoop to the lowest possible level. No scam is so sleazy that some social engineer wouldn't be willing to try it. There's really no way to avoid being exposed to social engineering. You're probably going to encounter it someday in some form or another. What you can and should do is become familiar with the different flavors of social engineering so that you notice when you're being scammed, and so that you'll take a moment to reflect skeptically on the scam. Your emotions are going to try to convince you to participate by downloading a file or clicking on an enticing link, but sometimes your emotions will lead you astray. Slow down and think about what you're doing. That's all for now on social engineering. In the next lesson, I'll show you how to examine a hyperlink so that you can tell whether or not it's safe to click on it before you click on it.